In this tutorial, we will discuss the basics of HTML. We will explain and demonstrate an HTTP proxy, JavaScript, cascading style sheets more commonly referred to as CSS, HTML forms and elements, and URL as well as Base64 encoding. An HTTP or web proxy intercepts traffic between a client system and a remote web application. If you'd like to know more about this particular proxy I'm using as well as how to configure it, please view our video entitled Intro to Burp Suite. Now I've configured my browser to pass web traffic to my local intercepting proxy. The intercepting proxy is software that is running on our machine. It gives us the ability to intercept requests and responses, modify them, and perform automation and analysis of the web traffic being passed through it. So I'm going to go ahead and enable this browser to pass traffic through my local intercepting proxy. I'm going to send a request off and I really just want you to see that we are intercepting requests, we can view them, we can modify them, we can see the responses in their raw form and the intercepting proxy really just gives us some granular control over what's going on. So to reiterate, an intercepting proxy is really a tool we as an attacker can use to control what is going on under the hood as traffic passes from our browser to the remote web application. JavaScript is a powerful language that drives most of the web applications you interact with on the web. It can be used to make requests, interact with and change DOM attributes, and is responsible for much of how a web application works, at least on the client side portion of things. Although there are now web applications whose server side code is driven by JavaScript using Node.js, we will discuss JavaScript only in the context of its traditional form, which is executing and processing within the client's browsers. Meaning, the code runs only in your browser. This is why you hear folks say that client-side code or JavaScript is not a security measure, but rather an optimization measure. Meaning, for example, once a request has left your browser and now is in the hands of an intercepting proxy, any restrictions placed on how you interact with the site via the browser, such as only requiring digits for a zip code form field, well, those restrictions are no longer enforced and can be easily bypassed. What we have is a simple web page with almost no functionality. We want to add some JavaScript to this page in order to manipulate the look and feel. The script tags denote that any code written between these tags is JavaScript code. The first piece of functionality we will demonstrate is executing a simple alert box that says hi. And you can see it executes. Notice those two forward slashes as we comment out this line of code. Two forward slashes denote a one line commenting out of the code. The forward and back slashes have an asterisk either prepended or appended and this is an easy way to write multi-line comments. Next, we will add a div to our HTML code. We do not want to show this div when the page loads, so we will add display none. We will provide it an ID of test, and we'll add some text within this div. It says this is to show some cool effects. Google hosts JavaScript libraries that we can include inside of our application. We will choose the popular library called jQuery, which allows us to access methods or functions that were pre-written by other developers, simplifying the development process. In jQuery, when deciding what element to perform some functionality on, you'll see the comma and dollar sign, along with either a pound symbol for IDs or period symbols for classes. In this case, we choose pound test as we have given our div an ID of test. We now want to call fade in on that div, a function provided by jQuery, and tell it to fade in over the course of four seconds measured in milliseconds, so 4,000. And as you can see, it works. The last bit of JavaScript that I'd like to show you demonstrates that JavaScript has the ability to modify DOM attributes, and this could be, in a security context, fairly dangerous. So we're going to specify document.location, 
and give it a location value of invisium.com. And when we refresh the page, we will be redirected to invisium.com. You could imagine the security implications if you were able to perform cross-site scripting and give the user a location of a malicious website. CSS is used to style a web page and provide proper placing, width, height, color, and other styling decisions on HTML elements. So our goal is to change the color of the text that reads, this is to show some cool effects from black to red. Much like JavaScript, we can write this code directly in the HTML file. We will create style tags which, much like JavaScript tags, denotes that all code written within these style tags is CSS code. We will select the div that we'd like to change by its ID, so we will have to use the pound symbol. We will enter pound test followed by curly braces and enter the styling choice, which is to ensure that the div's contents are the color red. Now much like JavaScript, we have the choice of writing directly inside the HTML file or to write the code somewhere else and have it pulled into the HTML file. To do this, we will create an additional file, a CSS file, and link to it within our HTML code. We will cut and paste the contents of the script tag along with the tags themselves into the CSS file. We will remove the style tags as they are not necessary when writing CSS code directly within a CSS file. Now we will embed the link for a CSS file into our HTML code. We will specify a relationship or rail of style sheet. This gives context to what we are pulling into our HTML code. Additionally, we will specify the type as text CSS, and finally provide an href to the sample.css file we've just created. Lastly, to demonstrate this all works as expected, we will change the div's contents from red to blue. Now we will refresh our browser to test our changes, and they work. HTML forms are common and are typically used when submitting some information to a web application. The very basic attributes needed in order for a form to work are action and method. Action specifies the location that this request will be sent to and method specifies the type of HTTP method format used for this request. In this case, a post request. We will add input fields so that a username and password can be entered. Type specifies the type of content that this input will contain. Name specifies the name of the parameter that will be submitted to the application. And placeholder shows some text that can be used to describe what should be entered into the input field. Lastly, we will create a submit button so that when a user clicks on this button, the values of the form fields are sent to forward slash example using a post request as stated in the method and action attributes. Now, since a password is being entered, we want to obfuscate that data from any prying eyes. This means we will change the type from text to password. Additionally, we will enter some line breaks so the form is vertical rather than horizontal. And we'll enter in some fake credentials. Ignore the error as we are using a simple HTTP server which does not support post requests. Instead, focus on the fact that the form did indeed send the request using a post request format. The last thing about HTML forms that I would like to discuss is the feature known as autocomplete. This feature is a security vulnerability, although it does enhance a user's experience. Basically, when a user begins to enter in some information, the browser will populate both the username and password. This means the password is now retrievable by an attacker because it lives in plain text within the form field. Additionally, this feature, when disabled, and in most browsers, will not allow whatever was entered to be saved. Useful for password fields or credit card forms. What you can see here is that as I begin to enter in some information, the browser shows what it's remembered and saved, so you see the full email address within that uh, input field. So what we're going to do is we're going to go directly into the source code within our browser and we're going to disable autocomplete because by default it's always enabled, it's always turned on. 
And as I stated before, sometimes this can be a security vulnerability depending on the information being entered. So we'll put autocomplete off as an attribute assignment and we will go ahead and try to enter in some information and you'll see that it doesn't pre-populate or save that value. Now we can do that on an individual input field or we can do it for the entire form within the form definition. Additionally, we can just do it on the input fields that we would like to have this feature disabled on versus the entire form field. An HTML page, when broken down to its very basic structure, contains the following. An HTML opening and closing tags. Within that, there's a head and opening closing tag. And body opening and closing tag, following the head opening and closing tags. The title tag specifies the title of the web page, as you can see in our browser. The body typically contains the meat of the content, such as form fields, radio buttons, checkboxes, div tags, etc. One important thing to note, which we've briefly covered a couple times, is the element ID and element class. An ID is very specific and is only meant to be used once by an HTML element within a web page. A class means that multiple HTML elements can use this designation, common when a redundant bit of JavaScript or styling code needs to execute on multiple HTML elements within the web page. To demonstrate this, we will italicize the content within any div that has the sample class designation. This code works. Additionally, we want to create a second div that is almost a duplicate of our first div. However, because the fade in JavaScript function will only execute on the first element loaded within a specific web page with a specific ID, we must remove display none, otherwise you will not be able to see its contents. What you will notice is that while the fade in feature only executes on one div, since fade in is called on the element's ID, the italicized font property executes and styles both divs. This is because it uses the class designation versus the div identifier. There are two common encoding schemes that are used when interacting with the web. Base64 is easily decoded, and to demonstrate that, we will enter some text into our proxy's decoder encoder tool and encode it. Base64 encoding is used to ensure that content stays intact when transferring over various mediums, but in no way should be used as a security mechanism. This holds true for any encoding format as it's easily reversible. URL encoding is a common standard that servers and browsers use to send properly formatted data to each other. We will send a request to search by IP on this analytics feature. When we intercept the request, you can see the parameters in the path portion of this get request are URL encoded. After sending these parameters to the decoder function, you can see how they are quickly reversed. URL decoding is of great importance from a functionality perspective, but can sometimes affect your attacks. For instance, you may need to add a white space or new line character into a parameter or request header. You may not get your desired results without first URL encoding. Conversely, sometimes cross-site scripting attempts fail because they are URL encoded and when rendered back are still in the native URL encoded format. I'm Ken Johnson. This has been another episode of SetCast. Thanks for watching.